All right. Um, okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another talk in our exciting seminar series. Today, our speaker is Professor Laura Lil Taiza. She is a professor at Technical University of Munich. Before that, she did her postdoc at ETH Zurich, uh, Switzerland. She obtained her PhD from Leibniz University of Hanover in Germany. Uh, she pursued her BSc and MSc in telecommunications engineering at the Technical University of Catalonia in Barcelona. She's a recipient of the Sofia Kovalevskaya Award for her social maps project. And she leads Dynamic Vision and Learning Group at TUM. Uh, her research spans from video object segmentation to image-based localization, though I mostly know her from her work in multi-object tracking. She's also one of the creators of the multi-object tracking benchmark. I'm um, really excited to hear about some of the latest paradigms in MOT. So without further ado, welcome Prof Professor Taiza, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you Tahar for the nice introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so maybe unsurprisingly, today I will talk about multiple object tracking. Um, so I've been working uh, on this for a while now, uh, since my PhD essentially, and things have changed a lot. So I found it fitting to talk about shifting paradigms for multiple object tracking, and also a bit of a, of a different topic towards the end of the talk if there's time. Good, so let's start by um, talking about what is the, the task at hand, right? So I'm sure you're all familiar with multiple object tracking. Uh, we have this type of sequences, moving camera, static camera, and the goal is to detect and track all the objects in a scene. And here objects can be of the same category, for example, all pedestrians or all cars, or can be, you know, any object that you're interested in, in actually detecting and tracking in the scene. Um, now, very, very classically, this um, problem has been tackled with a tracking by detection paradigm. And I say very, very classically because this is already a paradigm that we were using during my PhD, so a while ago. And um, while this was, uh, why this was so successful is because it um, decouples the problem into two parts, two, let's say, manageable parts. Now, the first part is the detection part. Uh, where you actually apply a detector on each frame of the video to obtain a set of proposed locations. So you kind of break out the problem from working on all pixels of the video to working on just a subset of interesting regions uh, for each of the images. And of course, detection is a hard problem on its own. So here you can see, for example, acceptable boxes, which are the red boxes, and less acceptable boxes, which are the yellow ones, which could be false positives. Um, and, and also in this case, a person that has not been detected here. So of course, all these problems of detections are sort of carried away into the second part, which is data association. So this is the part where you actually take those boxes, those proposals, and you try to recover trajectories. So you try to connect these detections in the temporal domain to recover trajectories. And of course, things get harder if, for example, you don't have the bounding box, as is, for example, the case of the green trajectory here, which tries to match to something but doesn't find any evidence of a pedestrian in the next frame, and therefore it just cuts the trajectory. So here you can see how the problems of detection are sort of carried away in tracking. Um, so um, we recently did an analysis on the Mod Challenge benchmark after seeing many, many hundreds of trackers being submitted there. We did an analysis on, you know, how did methodology evolve for multiple object tracking? So here we can see that in 2016 until 18, there was this trend of working with data association. So creating these huge graph, graph models, uh, solving them with optimization techniques, trying to find an explanation for all these bounding boxes and trying to find a coherent trajectories um, for all the video uh, sequence. Um, there was also this trend even before that in 2015 um, of working with motion models. And I did myself some work on using, for example, social forces to better predict how pedestrians will move, especially in crowded scenes. Um, but this was quickly abandoned for data association methods. Um, then we see a shift a bit towards online appearance adaptation models uh, in which they try to learn how the appearance of the pedestrian will change. 
And recently, what I think a really cool paradigm um, that recently appeared is the paradigm of tracking by regression, or let's say what I call tracking by regression. Um, so we kind of started this, um, this line of work with our ICCB 2019 paper, so now two years ago, in which we said, um, look, um, we are actually not taking advantage enough of the detectors that we have at hand. So detectors, uh, what, what, how we're currently we're using them or how we're using them back at the time was just applying them frame by frame and that's it. And we said, well, can detectors, um, now modern detectors, they work really well. Can they actually do a bit more? And so we focus on regression-based detectors, like for example, faster RCNN. Um, so this take an input image, process it through a series of convolutions to obtain a feature representation of that image. Now in a second stage, they actually take a series of interesting regions in the scene called region proposals, and they actually um, look at the feature representation of these proposals. And now from this feature representation, we want to obtain two things. We want to classify this region proposal. Is this a person? Is this a car? Or is this just background? And we want to regress the bounding box for this proposal. And the regression head is actually the interesting thing here for the tracking problem. So the regression head, what it does is it takes this region proposal, which you know might not be quite well located on top of the pedestrian, and it's shifted by a small amount so that it's placed nicely um, around the pedestrian. So this is quite a nice behavior, right? I had my box here, which was not really well placed on top of the pedestrian, and now suddenly my regression head is capable of regressing a nice tight bounding box around the pedestrian. So what we thought back at the, at the time was, well, this is very, very similar to what we actually want to do in online tracking. And by online tracking, I mean when you want to track bounding boxes from one frame to the next. So not batch processing and obtaining the trajectories for the whole video, but just going one frame at a time. And when you process one frame at a time, you know that your bounding box has not shifted by a lot. It's just moving slightly from one position to the next. So what we said is, okay, what if we take our detector, which is trained as a detector, but we use it for tracking. And this is how we came up with the name Tractor, which is a detector that has tracking capabilities. So essentially how we want to use the regression head for tracking is by, um, let's say we start at frame T plus one, right? So I've been tracking these three pedestrians for a few frames. And so I know exactly what was the detection of these pedestrians one frame before. Now you can see that these persons of course have moved one frame. So the boxes are not really well placed. They are in the position where the pedestrian was before. But now what we can do is take the bounding box regression from the detector, which I haven't trained at all for tracking. And I can ask this regression to tightly fit to the pedestrian which is closest to the position where the box was. So basically it transforms these boxes from frame T to these boxes from frame T plus one. Now this is nice, now we have tight fitting bounding boxes, but the question is, is this really tracking, right? Are we really solving the tracking problem here? Now, the question that I want to answer to know whether I'm doing tracking or not is, can I actually link the detections from one frame to the next. So can I predict where the detection with let's say ID one, so the red box, where did this box go in the next frame? Now, since I know that this box was regressed to this position, I can actually assign it the same ID. And this is in fact what I did with my colors here. So since I can actually do this assignment, I can answer this question positively and hence I can answer that I'm doing tracking. So this is essentially um, the work that we did, um, which, which sort of started this, this tracking by regression trend. And so um, then more and more work started taking, um, using this paradigm of basically um, using the bounding boxes from the previous frame and regressing them 
using uh, various techniques, um, also um, using, for example, neural networks and neural networks trained for detection. And so um, this, this task of tracking and detection started to get merged. Um, so they started to get merged with our work tractor, um, then came other works which used exactly the same paradigm and contributed to tracking by regression, like, for example, the regression of center points, uh, which is what center track did. And arguably, you can say that all of these works are using more spatial cues than appearance cues. Um, so this is something that is really important because there was all this paradigm of using appearances and using very strong appearance models and adaptable appearance models. And now here we showed that actually spatial cues are much more important to obtain state-of-the-art results. Now that doesn't mean that we are not using any appearance cues if we want to obtain top performance, right? Um, so we know that um, we can use extremely well-trained regressors for tractor, and this gives us very nice position bounding boxes. We can train our model for still images. This is great, for example, if you now instead of persons, you want to track very specific set of cells, for example, from microscope images. You don't need to annotate videos, but now you only need to annotate still images. So this is great. Tractor is online. This is also great. But there are several problems with Tractor. And this is due to the fact that you're actually not using this appearance, as I've said, but you're using more like the spatial continuity that we want, uh, that we assume to have in tracking. So our model has essentially no notion of identity, right? So if you have really crowded spaces or if your camera is moving a lot, um, you will get confused trajectories and you will get essentially identity switches. Now, um, another problem that we have is that as any online tracker, the track will be killed if the target becomes occluded, right? This is the problem that, that we have often in tracking. Now, thankfully, we have tools um, that have been used within the tracking community to overcome these problems, like, for example, re-identification models. So these are models that take two detections or more detections and try to figure out whether these belong to the same pedestrian or not solely based on appearance. So this is a little bit where appearance comes in in our model. And finally, a third problem that we have is that um, the regressor can only be trained to shift the box by a small quantity. And we try to train it to shift by larger quantities and it doesn't really work. So when you have large camera motions, when you have low frame rate and hence pedestrians move a lot from one frame to the next, it turns out this detector doesn't really, this tracker doesn't really work. So we need um, a small compensation for example, um, a camera motion compensation or a motion model that will predict where these boxes are going. So it is a nice model, right? Um, it is very simple, but we do need this extra motion models, this extra re-identification to actually um, really make it work and achieve really nice state-of-the-art results. Um, so with this um, tracking by regression, the landscape of research changed a little bit. So you can see here all the works that sparked um, this tracking by regression uh, trend that started in 2018, 2019. And you can see how actually the performance, so here I'm plotting the performance in the y-axis and the years in the x-axis. And you see how the performance really increased with this new tracking by regression um, paradigms, which are represented here by these stars. So this was really nice, right? We, um, we really sort of push forward here the field. But now the question is, well, I did quite, um, quite well at merging the tracking and detection task, but I want to go even further, right? I want to really couple uh, these two tasks seamlessly uh, so that detection takes advantage of tracking and tracking takes advantage of detection. So how can I actually merge these two tasks even further? And this maybe unsurprisingly is where um, attention or transformers or graph neural networks, however you wanna call them, um, this is where these come in. Unsurprisingly, because nowadays if you don't use attention in your papers, um, well, you're kind of missing out on something, right? Um, but we were seeing this coming from several works 
uh, both on the detection side and on the tracking side. Uh, so on the detection side, probably you are uh, already super familiar with uh, DETER, which is a detector um, with transformers, so with these attention mechanisms. And what is really cool about this work is that um, it directly predicts with this transformer decoder, it directly predicts bounding boxes where our object of interest might be. And it does this by using the concept of object queries, which will be useful for our work later on, which are essentially just you know, latent variables that get transformed into these boxes, which now have a meaning. So they have a location and they have a class attached to it. And this transformer decoder gets the information from the image thanks to a transformer encoder, which takes all these nice features coming from the CNN encodes them and gets them ready for the decoder, which will use them to predict, you know, that there's a person here, that there is no object here. So this is basically background, et cetera, et cetera. So this was work that, that we saw um, on detection. Um, then we also had some work on actually tracking from, from our lab in, in 2020. And this was, um, this was the other half of the puzzle, right? So this was going a little bit back to um, the tracking by detection paradigm and saying, can we actually learn to perform data association? So the second step in tracking by detection, can we actually learn to perform this with what we call a neural solver? Um, so the cool thing here is that um, we were taking bounding boxes. So this was kind of the starting point. And with this neural solver, we were directly predicting trajectories. And we were doing this by kind of reusing this idea of using graphical models to perform tracking. Um, so let me go a little bit more into detail what I mean here. Um, so in, in the classic view of using a graphical model to solve the tracking problem, what we do is uh, we take the set of detections as the initial set, and we create a graph. And this graph has nodes, which actually represent a bounding box. So each bounding box is represented by a node. And then the nodes are connected by edges. And so you can imagine that if you have two boxes and they are connected by an edge, if after solving uh, this graph model, this edge is called active, so this connection is active, this means that these two bounding boxes belong to the same person belong to the same trajectory. So this is essentially how we solved um, tracking back in the day. But now with this, um, with this graph neural networks, what we can do is we can do exactly the same, take advantage of this formulation of, of a graph model for tracking, but perform the association and the feature learning together um, by just using machine learning. So essentially what we did is we fed these nodes with a small representation, appearance representation of this bounding box. So they have an idea what this person looks like. Um, then we perform what we call neural message passing. And this allowed us to refine the features that can be found inside these nodes. So basically um, this is a sort of communication between nodes. It, I look at the features of my neighboring nodes what do they look like? Are they similar to mine or not? Is it possible that this node um, is representing the same person or not? So these are all steps that are learned. Actually, how to propagate this information is all learned. And in the end, we just have a loss, which is very simple, an edge classification loss, right? So should this connection be active or not? And if this connection is active, it means that these two bounding boxes are connected and are forming a trajectory. For example, the yellow trajectory. Now, what is really cool here is that you can actually back propagate from the trajectories all the way to the image. It's not always so easy to do so because you have to back propagate also through the CNN. And so what we did is we stopped at the neural message passing, but theoretically you could actually do so. So this is all cool, right? We have um, transformers used for detection. We have uh, graph neural networks, which is essentially a superset um, of transformers. Um, and it's now doing the data association. So what we now want to do is uh, we want to go to a third paradigm. 
we want to go to the paradigm of tracking by attention. Can I actually fuse um, these two works on detection and data association and really perform tracking by detection with attention transformers, graph neural networks, however you want to call it. So the cool thing about attention here is that it will jointly solve the detection and the tracking task, right? So they will no longer be separate. I will still use the concept of tracking by detection, but now they will actually become really one. And so one of the solutions that we presented um, is, is the work uh, Trackformer. So how this works is essentially um, we pose multiple object tracking as a frame-to-frame -frame set prediction problem. So remember that data had um, detection as a set prediction problem. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to perform online tracking. So this is going to be prediction of boxes frame by frame. And it's also going to be a set prediction problem. So for the first frame at t uh, times zero, um, t equals zero, I mean, um, we don't have any tracking knowledge here, right? We have to start trajectory somewhere. So this is essentially how data performs detection. I have my object queries, they go to the decoder and they predict, for example, that there are three bounding boxes. Now the magic of tracking happens when I actually want to predict the same bounding boxes for the same pedestrians in the next frame, right? This is no longer a detection problem, but a tracking problem. So how I connect the two frames is by this connection here, this arrow here, which is going to take my predictions and it's going to use them here as what we call track queries. So we had object queries for detection. Now we have track queries for tracking. And these are here represented by colors because they do contain already an ID, right? I know exactly which ID um, these track queries are following which is the red, the green, or the blue. So that's why they are color coded. And so whenever a track query goes through a transformer decoder and predicts a new box in the new location, I can directly assign the same ID as the frame before. For example, the red ID or the green ID or the blue ID. Of course, I still have my object queries here, right? Because it can still be that there's a new pedestrian appearing in the scene. And therefore, this will become a track query for the next frame. At the same time, what can happen is that a pedestrian disappears. So here I have my blue track query, which did not predict anything in the next frame, which means that this person actually disappeared from the scene. So let's take a look a little bit more at how features from the image are used in this encoder decoder transformer and how, like, what are the main ingredients that actually allow me to predict these trajectories. So first of all, I'm going to have an encoding of the frame features, so the image features, uh, with self-attention in the transformer encoder. And this information goes um, to the transformer uh, decoder, right? So the image information is going to the decoder. And here I have two very nice, um, two very nice ingredients that are actually need to make tracking happen. First of all, I need to can concatenate object and track queries, right? I need to put them into the same playing field so that they can actually go forward into the decoder and they can be decoded as boxes. And a second important ingredient I have is the self attention. So attention between track queries and object queries and the encoder decoder attention, which will allow me to take information from the image. Finally, the third step is basically the mapping of the queries to bounding boxes and class predictions. This is the same as that. Now let's look a little bit more into detail as this um, transformer query decoder, and what is, the, uh, what is the interesting part there for tracking? Um, so we, I said that we have self-attention between queries, but why is that interesting for tracking? So first of all, um, let's say we need to initialize a new track. So let's say that I have the case here where uh, the purple person appears on this, uh, on this frame. The question is, how can I make sure that this person is a new person indeed, and is not a person that should be followed by one of the track queries? 
the only way I can do this is if the track queries and the object queries talk to each other before going into my decoder. That's why having self-attention between track and object queries is very important. And the same goes for terminating an occluded track. How do I know that this track needs to be terminated? I need to look at the other image evidence. I need to look at the other object queries and track queries and make sure that no one is stealing my bounding box, right? So if I'm, for example, the track query blue, and suddenly I can find no other bounding box that I can predict, it really has to mean that all the other track queries are tracking their own boxes and not mine, and that I really have no possibility of predicting a box, meaning that the trajectory is actually um, terminated. So that's also important, um, an important reason for having self-attention between queries. And the second important ingredient that I've said is the encoder-decoder attention. So this is what allows us to actually look at the image evidence. And therefore, it's extremely important to find a new object in the frame, right? You need image evidence to predict the new object. But you also need it to adjust um, for the bounding box positions, right? So if I have a track query, which implicitly has a position encoded there, same as, as data queries, there, there is an implicit position encoded there. Um, one thing the track query could do is predict exactly the same position for the next frame. But if it looks at the image evidence and sees that the person has moved, then it has the necessary information to shift the box where this new pedestrian has moved. So, okay, this is all very cool. Laura, you explained, you know, transformers, yeah, very nice, but um, can you actually do more than what you did with Tractor, for example? So can you recover from occlusion? So this was actually quite a hard task for Tractor. But here we can do a very simple thing. We can actually keep the track queries active for a time window. So for example, I have my blue query, uh, blue track query, which doesn't predict any box for one frame. It's fine. I just keep it active, which means that I'm still feeding this query to future transformer decoders for a time window, just in case you know this person reappears from behind an occlusion. If the person reappears, there's a very high chance that the blue query will pick it up and continue tracking it. So there's no need to have an extra read head. This is really cool because it's all embedded into this transformer decoder. The bad thing now is that, as I said, there is spatial information that is embedded into each track query. And this actually prevents the application of the track queries for really long-term occlusions where your pedestrian, let's say, is walking on the left side of the image, then goes occluded for a lot of frames, and then appears on the right side of the image really, really far away from where it disappeared. This is where um, track queries uh, do not work anymore. Okay, so how is this whole thing trained? Um, so first of all, we need two frames, right? Because um, the track queries uh, need to be trained with two frames. Um, the first thing that you, know, that you do is basically what Deter does. So you have the object detection step at frame T minus one with the object queries only. And in the second step, now you can start doing tracking. So you have your object queries plus your track queries, and you're going to predict the objects, the new objects at frame T. Now at a third step, you need to assign these predictions of frame T with ground truth, which you can do either with a track ID or with a bounding box, uh, because these are new object queries. And finally, you can compute the loss that will train your model, which is um, the classic classification loss. Is there a pedestrian? Is there no object? Is there a car? And also the bounding box loss, because you want really well positioned bounding boxes. Now, during training, um, there can happen several things. Um, one is that the box at frame T comes from a track query, which means that we can directly assign the same ID as it had in T minus one. This is the easy case for tracking. The second case is that the query at T minus one is matched to a background class, so it predicts no box. This means that my object is either occluded or has left the scene. And the third case is when there are new objects which never appear at t minus one and they are predicted from object queries and not track queries and these are matched by classification and box score and they mean actually these new objects 
that are entering the scene. And of course, they do not have a track query, but they are predicted only from object queries. Okay, so let's see what do we actually need uh, to make this work. Um, so first of all, um, we can actually take any uh, two pairs of a video and use them for uh, to simulate tracking scenarios. So we only need two frames, this is really nice. Uh, so we can sample any two frames. And uh, this is the top performance that we will start our relation studies um, from. Uh, this is the MOTA, so the object, uh, multiple object tracking accuracy, and the idea of one which represents how uh, reliably I can track identities. So basically saying, I don't have too many ID switches in my trajectories. Now we start taking away ingredients. So we take away, first of all, uh, pre-training on a detection data set. So this kind of started with center track, which showed that um, actually training uh, or pre-training the model on this data set, which is crowd human, really nicely boosted the results. So if you take this away, you see that there's quite a drop in performance. So having a really large data set to train from is really an advantage. And this is something that tracking by regression methods, or in this case, um, this, uh, this method where you have true frames, you can actually benefit from this. Um, then we have um, track query re-identification. So this, I haven't talked uh, about this. Um, sorry, I have, I have talked about this. This is about uh, the, so the reuse of these track queries for a certain time window. So this helps a lot, especially um, in retaining this, uh, these identities. And what I haven't talked about is a couple of track augmentations that are really useful. Um, so there are two augmentations that we do. The first one is to add false positive track queries. So just creating track queries, uh, which actually come from false positive in the previous image to sort of train the network that sometimes there are false positives. So don't go ahead and create a bunch of ghost trajectories. And the second augmentation is um, that instead of just sampling always two consecutive frames from, from my video, I'm going to sample frames which are further apart. Let's say 10 frames apart, 15 frames apart. And this is to simulate you know, camera motion where there's a lot of displacement between detections or to simulate low frame rate. And you can see here how uh, performance is affected if I actually take out this, these augmentations. But of course, the key absolute key ingredient is the actual track queries, right? So how we propose to do tracking, which is by using these track queries, is what really makes the magic happen. And so if we train only with object queries for detection and then do a sort of a greedy tracking by detection association, which is uh, what center track did for one of the baselines, uh, then you see that the capability of keeping these identities really, really goes down. So th this is um, to show that actually track queries do have the power of performing tracking. Um, so then, sure, we compare to, um, to other state-of-the-art trackers, we see that the actual paradigm of tracking by attention is really more powerful than tracking by regression. And uh, especially compared to, for example, center track, which does have a superior backbone. Um, so we can see here that, um, that we do have a nice performance boost. And especially if you're looking, for example, at public detections, you see that the capability of track former in keeping identities is much, much superior to the center track. Okay, so um, we have seen a little bit of this, of this uh, shifting paradigm, right? So starting from tracking by detection, going through uh, tracking by regression, and now hopefully tracking by attention, uh, which we hope that also changes the field quite a lot. And track former is one way of doing tracking by attention. Uh, which actually merges the detection and tracking task even further for an end-to-end -end solution. And I think this has actually the nice potential for tasks where detection is really hard, right? For example, for small pedestrians, there like it is very, very, uh, it is a very hard problem in many of the mod challenge sequence when you have really small pedestrians, you barely have any detection evidence in there. 
And this is where I think um, this paradigm could actually uh, boost results there because you're actually seeing something move. Uh, so you need less evidence to detect and more evidence for tracking. And hopefully by merging these two tasks, um, these, uh, these small detections can be, can be further improved. Okay, so this is the, the end of, let's say the first part of the talk. I don't know how am I uh, with time. So, so can I start, let's say a slightly new topic now? Um, I, I guess sure, but can we ask questions in the meantime or should we wait until the end? Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's, let's go for questions now. Okay, I, I have one, that's why. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, sure. Basically in this last two paradigms, tracking by regression and tracking by attention, we are modifying the detections, right? We are kind of creating private detections in a sense in terms of MOT terminology. Do you think we should evaluate these detections in terms of detectors performance, compare them to other baseline detectors and so on? Or mm -hmm. it does not matter, like what, what's your opinion on that? Um, I can say that this is a question of a person that has really worked on tracking because it's, it's a very, very subtle question, but a super important one, right? So um, I'm gonna be very honest here. So I was the first person to say, look, um, you know, before 2015, before we, we presented Mod Challenge, it was really chaos. So people in tracking were using the detections that they wanted. They were doing tracking by detection, which means that the starting point of the detections in terms of accuracy is super important, but they were not saying anything. They were just saying, here are my tracking results. No one knows what was the starting point. So this was basically the main motivation for saying, look, we need a set of public detections and everyone is going to perform tracking on those. Now, when you go away from the paradigm of tracking by detection, things change slightly, right? So we try to do our best to show that um, indeed our tracking by regression, and in fact, we have an analysis on, on, the, on the tractor paper on how we actually try to make it as fair as possible that we are matching public detections, right? So we don't predict a location where there was not a public detection, we don't start trajectories where there is no public detection, things like this. Um, but I, I think we should have been more aware that this was opening a Pandora box, right? Because right now um, it's a bit chaos what, what public and private um, detections mean. And the line is getting more and more blurry. Mm -hmm. So we are indeed looking for solutions there. So if you have any solution, we're, we're super happy. But at the same time, we don't want to to slow down research, right? So, so these are paradigms that are working really well. So we cannot suddenly say, no, let's go back to the public detections, right? Even if these detections would be improved now, I don't think we can go back. Um, so I think more and more people are trying to, to shift towards comparing on private detections, uh, providing a sort of projection, let's say to the manifold of public detections, Right, And this projection has been defined either by the tractor way of doing things or the center track way of doing things. So the projection is sort of fixed. And then by trying to use a similar backbone so that the capabilities at least of, of processing the image are quite similar, right? Or that the you know, number of parameters doesn't suddenly explode, for example. Um, and I think th this is sort of a way of more or less handling it but it's not as clear as the public detections as it was before. Um, so it's a big good question. I haven't answered it at all because we are still trying to figure it out, um, but hopefully we're going to, to a more standardized way of comparing again, yeah. Um, I have one more if there isn't any. We were examining the results of message passing neural network, the graph neural network solution that you showed, and it was very good in terms of handling post positives, for example. And I'm a bit surprised to see that this was not the case for the track former. Why do you think track former is doing worse or bad in terms of false positives, especially compared to center track? False positives were like twice or three times more. Um, so I think this is a question of how you perform the, the track augmentations, um, right? So you saw here, if I go back here, uh, that the track augmentations for the po false positive does have quite an effect, especially on MOTA. And this is because of this reduction of ghost trajectories, right? So if you don't train the model, um, where, where do I have it? 
here. If I don't train the model with false positive track queries, means that I have a track query that comes from a false positive, and now I want to train my tracker to actually kill it, right? Because I don't want to create a trajectory from that. Um, I think this is one of the things that actually does help with false positives, but I think there are other augmentations that we should be doing in order to further reduce the false positives and that we are not doing right now. Um, so this is one of the things that I think it's not as clear as with the, with the graph model, because there we already know how to deal with false positive, right? There's the whole literature on this. And so we just took the same, the same approach. Here, it's not so clear. So I think, I think the augmentations will play more of a key role here if we want to further reduce the false positives. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Laura. I, I think I, I could ask more, but we should let you talk about the new stuff. <laughs> I, I have a question. Sure. And I would like to know if you have tried these this new frameworks, the, track, the tracker by regression and the tracker by augmentation in, in point clouds or uh, the image. Point clouds, um, we, yes, um, let me remember. So we do have, I think a master thesis student that is working on the paradigm of tracking by regression for point clouds. Um, let's say de detecting, so tracking cars, for example, from point clouds, right? Um, it is actually totally doable, right? Because um, you just change the backbone for a backbone like, like KPCOM or a backbone that actually can process point clouds. And you pretty much train it the same way as a structure, for example. So I think this, this applies really, um, really nicely. Um, for the tracking by attention, we didn't try. We have we are working on some processing of, um, of point clouds with transformers. Um, there it's a little bit harder because the memory to process, to process point clouds um, is quite heavy when, we, when you want to use transformers. So it's not super straightforward to apply it there. Uh, but I think actually, I mean, if you look at the architecture, right? Um, I'm gonna go to architecture of, of better because I think this is easier. Um, you have your CNN backbone here, right? If you replace it by KPConf or any backbone that processes point clouds, well, that's pretty much it, right? You can do detection in 3D. You just need to change the loss a little bit there. Uh, but I think you could really directly apply it for, for detection. And then you can, of course, extend it for tracking with the track queries and everything that we use in, in tracking by attention. Um, so it's, it's definitely very, very applicable and, and easily extendable to other, other sensors. Okay, where can I, I find, where can I find more information about the, the master thesis that you mentioned? Oh, it's, it's still ongoing. So okay. unfortunately, not, not yet anywhere. Uh, but I will, I, if I remember, I can send it to, to Fadma once, once the student is finished. Okay, thank you. We are not working together, by the way. I, I don't know. We oh, sorry, not... sorry. It's okay. Uh, public. <laughs> um, but then, I can contact you by your email, I guess. Yeah, just, just write me an email and, and I'll see what, what I can find on documentation. But it, it's still not finished. So I there's not going to be much yet. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, maybe I can go very quickly over the new stuff. Um, well, not not super new, right? This this was already published in, in 2020, uh, but it's a, it's a project that I'm deeply caring about these days. And um, this all comes from the fact that, well, as you know, we are we are um, creating this um, this mod challenge benchmark. We created this in 2014, and I think this nicely pushed um, multiple object tracking to really going from this, you know, super easy scenes where you have these three pedestrians walking around. Now, I mean, it's quite ridiculous, but back in the day, we were we were working on this. Um, to these side types of scenes that are getting more and more crowded, they have really nice annotations. Uh, and finally, to these scenes that we have been releasing lately uh, for the for the mod 20, right? Where, where this is really super chaotic. Um, even obtaining the annotations was, was completely crazy. Um, but I think this nicely pushes researchers, right? To find more and more innovative solutions to deal with these problems. 
But we have, you know, there's this question that is always lingering out there. And that is that when we actually collect this data, um, we, we're not really keeping people's privacy, right? So, so we cannot collect this data in Europe, for example, due to like GDPR and other rules. Um, so we have to go to other countries that do allow data collection. But still, you know, I would like to create a benchmark um, that still respects people's privacy, right? So we have been working on a couple of directions on this. Um, I'm going to start with a newer direction, which I'm not going to explain because it's pretty self-explanatory, right? So this was uh, something that we presented at ICCV this year. Um, and this was about using synthetic data for tracking problems. And so we wanted to sort of analyze, you know, if I create a lot and a lot of um, these kind of scenarios with, with the GTA um, game engine, essentially, um, what do I actually need to get a good performance at, for example, mod challenge, right? So um, how can I improve my detection? How can I improve my re-identification, my tracking? You know, so we, we were just benchmarking several methods of detection, re-identification and tracking to see which one was working best with synthetic data. Do we need fine tuning, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're interested in that, um, you, can, you can go ahead and, and read the paper. Um, and this is one way of doing things, right? But everyone knows there is this domain gap, right, between synthetic and real. And in fact, we did need to train a little bit on real data to get to, to the nice performance of mod challenge. Um, so another um, second way that, that we're pursuing is the way of performing data anonymization. So taking our real images and, for example, I don't know, blurring the face, right, or, or, or putting a square on the face. Uh, so this is kind of the classic way of performing data anonymization. Uh, but when you actually want to perform detection and tracking, if I start blurring faces, or if I go and blur the whole silhouette of the person, then I have no more information to perform detection or to perform tracking. So I want to have a method that allows me to take, for example, a face or a full body, and transforms it into something that is still detected as a person or as a face. And of course, blurring doesn't work. I need, to, I need something smarter there. So I need to create something that has several properties. First of all, that it creates an anonymous face, that it's realistic, or at least realistic for a computer vision algorithm, that it's a new identity that I can actually control, and that it has temporal consistency because I want to perform tracking. So of course we cannot do things like face swapping, for example, because this would create a new fit. This is not really a new identity. Um, and so we were looking back into the literature, you know, what kind of methods are actually um, doing, are actually creating something which still looks like a face, but where the identity information is gone. And so we saw a lot of works on, um, on face, um, face manipulation, right? Um, so now I'm going to make a, like a small questionnaire to make this a little bit more interactive. So if you know the Celeb A data set, do not answer because you probably know already who this person is. So I can say that it's a male actor um, and this face has been anonymized. Now the question is how easy it is to actually find out who this person is. Um, so any clues here? I can show another anonymization if it makes things easier. I can even show a third anonymization if it makes things easier. Okay, so now this is good, right? Because these are the results of our method. So it's good that, that there, no one knows. Uh, now let's go for a competing method. So does anyone have an idea of who this actor is? Nicolas Cage. Okay, that's perfect, right? Because with just one anonymization, you can see already that this is in fact Nicolas Cage. And this goes from more anonymized to less anonymized. And this is actually the, the results of, of a competing method uh, that was kind of the, the state of the art at the time. And these are the results that we obtained with our CVPR paper. So I think we can 
we can really easily say that we have more anonymization capability. So we are really creating an identity uh, that is really much, much different from the original one. Um, so another, another thing that I want to have in this, um, in this framework is to have control, right? So I want to be able to take one face and change it into many different faces. And finally, I want to have the temporal consistency, which I've already talked about. Um, so how do we achieve this control is uh, by using uh, this MLP here, which is what is going to have a control over the identity. So let me talk about, in general, the architecture that we're using. Um, so we're going to use generative adversarial networks, right? They are well known for creating images that look really realistic. But here, what we want to do is we want to condition our generative model so that it takes, for example, a shape of the person and the background, and it creates a new face that nicely fits this background. And of course, this background can be the hair and only change the image, but it can also be the background of an image, and then the whole body has to be changed. So it's very flexible. And as I said, we want to have control over this identity generation, and this is where this MLP comes in. So let's look exactly at how this, this works. Um, first of all, we have the classic gun loss, right? We want our images to look realistic, so we're going to use the discriminator. And the interesting thing here is what we call the identity discriminator. So what this does is it takes one identity um, encoded as, as one hot encoding, and it passes it through the MLP. And now the generator, what it's trying to do is it's trying to take this input information and generate the face that roughly looks like the face of the control identity, right? So it's trying to infuse the control identity into the information of this person. And how we make this happen is by having also an identity discriminator that tries to bring the embedding obtained from this face and this embedding it tries to bring them closer, closer together. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm sort of mixing these two identities, right? The original identity and then the identity coming from the control and it's creating this new identity. Um, so this is basically what we, can, what we can see here. We can see the source image on the left and we can see several anonymizations which are controlled by the control identity. So you can see several characteristics of the control identity that are sort of being leaked into the, into the source image. And this is basically how we create a new identity. Now, I don't want to go into the details on numbers and so on and so forth, but I do want to show that it works rather well without much retraining for full bodies. Uh, so this is something that we're currently improving, but it was already nice to see in, that in our first version, uh, we obtain quite nice results. And in the, our latest version, which we now submitted to AJCV, um, I have to say that we obtain really, really cool generated faces. So we can see on the top left for each of the four images, the original image. Um, on the bottom left, we see the low resolution image that we are creating with one identity. And on the right, we see one high resolution image that we are creating. So this is a 512 by a 512 um, image, which is fully anonymized coming from this image here. So you can see that uh, we can handle several poses. We can handle uh, modest occlusion coming from the hair. Um, and you are actually creating images that look actually quite realistic in my view. Um, so this is something that um, that we have been working on quite actively. And now the question is, can we actually take this to full bodies to make it really work there? And can we actually apply it to more challenge and have, for example, the tracking performance not affected, right? This is something that we are currently studying. So I don't want to take more of your time. I'm already talking quite a lot. Um, so, yes, I want to thank, of course, the, all the co-authors that worked on, on all the papers that I presented, and I want to thank you, especially for your attention in reference to the, to the first work. And if you have any questions from the second part of the first part, I will be happy to answer them. Thanks a lot, Laura. 
I guess there were some questions in between, but any left? We have a couple of minutes, I guess, for maybe one or two questions. Tahir, I'm doing your job, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I guess there are no questions. That... Uh, I have one question, actually. Go ahead. Uh, it may not be so relevant, but uh, do you think this uh, anonymization operation uh, can be reversed? I'm mean, just wondering, for example, an anonymized face can be returned to original one? Mm -hmm. um, so if we don't reveal uh, the control identity, for example, uh, we don't reveal the generator, then it will be pretty hard to reverse this operation because it, these are just in the end, you know, a newly generated image. Um, but we didn't check for, let's say, guarantees in terms of, of proper data privacy, right? So, so in the field of data privacy, they do have those guarantees that have to be satisfied. We didn't check for those, mm -hmm. um, but we are looking also into finding these guarantees to see if, if this process is indeed non-reversible. But based on other words on guns, I would say it's probably not likely that you obtain the original identity. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yeah. I actually have a question about that as well. Moving consistently throughout the video, isn't this very tricky in terms of like keeping the pose and changing it smoothly? So um, I, ca I can show here some of the results of the, of the first method, so not the really high resolution one. And for example, this is myself anonymized. And you see that it, so there is a bit of flickering in the face, but in general, the identity is kept quite consistently throughout the video. Uh, now in, in the second version, we also have, um, for example, a temporal discriminator that looks at several frames in time in order to create smooth transitions. Um, and this brings further stability into the video. So, so there are things that we can do uh, for example, with temporal discriminators. Um, but we were surprised that already this frame-by-frame -frame processing was quite stable already. I see. Yeah. Looks good, actually. Thank you. Thanks, Laura, again. Yeah. For, for this great talk. And thanks, everyone. I'm going to stop recording.